Welcome to the Science and Cocktails podcast. Get on your spaceship. Interesting years. And now the machine is working. Increase the frequency of lucid dreams in our laboratories. Over time, the variation within a group becomes variation between groups. It has to do with particles or objects and how they move. Am I true? Am I We think that there is a kind of God against it. What are the processes? of stuff. We are moving in space time. All of us go like one second per second, flowing up in the fourth dimension. Hi, I'm Sophie Jort, and this episode of the Science and Cocktails podcast is about how climate change affects the spread of vector-borne diseases. Vector-borne diseases account for more than 70% of all infectious diseases, causing more than 700,000 deaths every year. Vectors are living organisms that can transmit infectious pathogens between humans or from animals to humans. Many of these vectors are blood-sucking insects. They inject disease-producing organisms during a blood meal from an infected host, a human or an animal, and then later transmit it into a new host after the pathogen has replicated. Often, once the vector becomes infectious, they are capable of transmitting the pathogen for the rest of their life, each bite or blood meal. So it's an intermediary host or an organism that transfer the disease from one person to another person. So you and I could not get malaria, for example, uh, unless we are in a blood bank. But you and I could not transmit the disease to from one to another without a mosquito being involved, a particular kind of a mosquito. This is Fleming Conradsen, who is a professor in environmental health and the head of the Department of Global Health at Copenhagen University. His research is, among a lot of other things, focusing on vector-borne diseases. Yellow fever or dengue or many other uh, viral or parasitic infections, they are transmitted by, for example, an insect. In the north, we are especially aware of bullariosis carried by ticks, which are increasing in numbers. We'll get back to why that is later. First, we'll travel to the tropical and subtropical areas, where the burden of the vector-borne diseases is highest, and the poorest population is most affected. Since 2014, major outbreaks of dengue, malaria, yellow fever, Zika, and many others has affected populations, claimed lives, and overwhelmed health systems in many country. With the dengue as an example. Dengue is the most prevalent violent infection transmitted by Aedes mosquitoes. More than 3.9 billion people in more than 129 countries are at risk of contracting dengue, with an estimated 96 million symptomatic cases. We see dengue very much and the increase in Asia. South Asia, Southeast Asia, partly Central Asia. Um, many urban settings, we see this becoming a rapidly increasing problem. Distribution of vector-borne diseases is determined by a complex set of demographic, environmental and social factors. In the global south, The climate change has as well as an increasing amount of garbage around households and in the streets affected the living conditions of mosquitoes in several ways. As the rainwater collects in the garbage, 
mosquito breeding sites are created. So it's an urban environmental management issue that gets, um, because solid waste management is an issue, water management is an issue, but then with increasing temperature and poverty and a poor, poorly functioning healthcare system, there's a likelihood that diseases like Zika and yellow fever and dengue and so on can spread locally. The increasing incidences of droughts and floods, rising temperature and increasing rainfall affect the number of mosquitoes, as well as the time it takes for the parasites to develop in the gut of a mosquito. The speed with which the parasite, for example, develop within a malaria mosquito or a mosquito that can transmit malaria is influenced greatly by temperature. So the higher the temperature, the shorter the time it takes for the parasite to develop in the mosquito. And since it's, it develops much faster at high temperature, that specific mosquito can transmit disease to more and more people. So for example, if it takes um, 10 days for the parasite to develop in a mosquito at a certain degree, then the lifespan of the mosquito may be 30 days, and if it takes 10 days for the parasite to develop under a given temperature, it only has 20 days left to transmit the disease. But if it can develop the parasite in much shorter duration, then it has more days left of its life to transmit the disease. So it's the potential um, capacity of the mosquito to spread the disease is depending upon temperature. But of course also the, the where the mosquito is having its uh, potential for lay eggs would depend upon rainfall. The survival of the mosquito would depend upon rainfall, humidity and temperature. Whether or not it can survive at high altitude is also depending upon temperature. So to a very large extent mosquitoes and the spread of a disease like malaria is regulated by temperature. Malaria, which is a parasitic infection transmitted by anopheline mosquitoes, is causing an estimated 219 million cases globally. And it results in more than 400,000 deaths every year. Most of the deaths occur in children under the age of five. In many Southeast Asian countries, where vector-borne diseases are significant health threats, Monitoring and control of the different mosquito species is practiced in several ways. So collections, indoor collections in houses or outdoor collections using what is called light traps or other traps, or human bait collections where you sit with your bare, bare legs and you wait for the mosquitoes to land and you suck them up in a small aspirator. Lots and lots of different kinds of collections of mosquitoes because it's such an important area of disease burden that you simply need to monitor um, what are the kinds of mosquitoes, what disease are they carrying, what are their behavior, are they resistant towards insecticides you use to kill them. So there's quite a significant research effort um, across many countries in Africa, Asia and Latin America. Often with the involvement of, of researchers from, from Europe, but significant capacity in country. In the northern part of the world, climate change also affects the living circumstances of some of the animals carrying diseases. An example is ticks, which are carrying the disease bullariosis. They live in moist areas and forests where the living conditions have improved due to climate change and changes in agricultural practices. So tick-borne diseases and climate change is super interesting in many ways because climate influences or climate change and the way we manage our forest areas or fields and green space um, all interacts with the spread of tick-borne diseases. 
also human behavior, the way we behave in forested area and how much we are in contact with forested area. So tick-borne diseases uh, we find are increasing in, in many parts of Europe. Borreliosis is one, uh, tick-borne encephalitis and so on. So ticks are dependent upon um, the management of our environment in terms of how much vegetation, the nature of the vegeta vegetation, um, the animal life in our forested areas, how you and I move about in the forested areas. So for example, if we have many more green fields across the year in our farmed area, because we want to reduce the outflow of nutrients into our water environment, that strategy of increasing green fields may increase the um, habitats available for certain animals that are also conducive for the spread of ticks. The temperature, the rainfall pattern would also influence the distribution of ticks directly because their survival and their activity earlier in the year may be influenced, but it could also be influenced by having more rainfall or more um, different environmental um, composition of vegetation induced by climate change, facilitating um, the introduction and survival of ticks, for example. So it's a complex but super interesting uh, case of how climate change, directly or indirectly, not just the survival of the tick and the time of activity of the tick, but also indirectly because it influences the vegetation, um, the the animals that are roaming in forested area um, and also how we behave in forested areas. Maybe time will be, climate will be more conducive for us to be outside with less, uh, wearing less clothes, maybe in shorts, moving about the forest, um, having more tick bites, for example. The increased number of ticks is an example of how both climate change and the interventions implemented to reduce climate change, along with the change of human behavior, are causing an increase in number of ticks. But also the mosquito-borne diseases, like malaria, could be heading for the north. So mosquitoes are important carriers of many different kinds of human disease. We all know malaria, but there could also be Zika, Dengue, Yellow Fever and many other. West Nile is recently introduced in the United States. So there, there are many inf infections, viral or parasitic infections, that are carried by mosquitoes. Yeah. And of course in Europe we see this as an issue because a particular mosquito that can carry some of these diseases moves north, more further and further north every year. So one of the reasons why we are now in Denmark and one of the reasons why malaria transmission has never been very efficient, although we have had malaria here, the parasite was introduced by someone, the, the mosquito, Anopheles mosquito is here, it can bite people for its blood meal to mature its eggs and in the reason why we never had very significant outbreaks of malaria was simply because it was only possible for the parasite to develop in the mosquito for a few weeks of the year, maybe a month and a half, simply because it's so cold that it takes too long for the parasite to develop, so the mosquito has died before it can transmit on the disease. So if we get in a situation where temperature for a prolonged period of time, it gets warmer and warmer, then we could imagine if the disease get introduced, there would be mosquitoes that live for, let's say, 30 days. The temperature would be so convenient for the parasite to develop in the mosquito that it, we could get local transmission at a higher potency. More people could get infected. So the North needs to learn from the South and incorporate some of the same practices of monitoring and controlling vectors as the vector-borne diseases become a greater health risk. 
I would say to a large extent we have forgotten uh, many of these skills in our in this part of the world, Europe and North America, because we haven't faced this challenge for many, many years, several generations. So whereas we used to have malaria many years ago, we haven't had in our training of new health professionals, uh, training of biologists, or keeping public awareness and attention about ticks or mosquitoes or flies. Apart from reducing the global climate change, a crucial element in reducing the burden of the vector-borne diseases is behavioral change. Education and improved public awareness is crucial so that people know how to protect themselves and their communities from mosquitoes, ticks, bugs, flies and other vectors. Access to water and sanitation is a very important factor in disease control and elimination. Therefore, improving water storage and sanitation is needed to control these diseases at the community level. Maybe in the future, more scientific research and financial means will search for solutions on how to eliminate vector-borne diseases as they are hitting for the northwestern part of the world. Thanks for listening to the Science and Cocktails podcast, which is funded by the Novo Nordisk Foundation and produced by me, Sophie Hjort. Music and sound effects is composed by Hjalte Bistad Müller and me, also known as Trumlerorchestret. Find future episodes on scienceandcocktails.org. <laughs>